Good morning. Welcome to Kesset, Columbia. So if your mouth is not full of donuts, you can jump in and sing with us. Well, once, once you're done, you know. No, it is good to be together. It's good to share life together and to gather together and worship together. That's what we've set aside this time to do right now. So if you'd like to join in by singing, if you'd like to stand, feel free. If you'd like to stay seated, that's fine. But mostly we just welcome you to join in and worship with us. And by the way, happy Father's Day. You'll find that that's going to be a theme today. And stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased in it. I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are when I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. And I've seen many searching for answers. what we need before we say your word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are when I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Who I am. You're a good, good father.
Amen. Um, so I've been doing this a long time, and in, in church, you know, we celebrate Mother's Day, and we celebrate Father's Day, and hopefully I can just say this right, but you know, Mother's Day, we're all celebrating everything, and then Father's Day, we celebrate, but for some reason, there's always this, this undertone of fathers. Sometimes it's just a sad day for some. And uh, we all have our stories, and, and I know that there's great ones, and you, you have great fathers and everything, but there's a lot where the fathers are just not what you expected. And um, I'm here to tell you that we serve a father. We worship a father who loves us unconditionally. No matter about our earthly father, we have a heavenly father who's always there, no matter what. And I know that that just doesn't take the pain away from all of it, but... There's something about it that you can go to and know that he is your father. He's the ultimate father. And he knows you. He knows each and every one of you. He's your father. And he loves you. I want to sing this song. It's, it's an older song, but how true it is. How much he loves us. I've had of me he formed my heart before even time began my life was in his hand he knows my name my name. 
Man, isn't it awesome, seriously, no matter where you're at, with your, like I said, with your earthly father, but you do have a father who is always there, who will never let you down, who scolds us, does everything that your earthly father should do. He does it with perfection. Amen? All right, let's take three, three minutes, three and a half minutes, whatever it is, and do, uh, do what you love to do and do some fellowshipping. We'll see you a little bit later. Columbia. How are you guys this morning? You are sugared up? All right. Well, if we have not had the privilege of meeting yet, my name is Mel, and I have just a couple quick Kesset announcements for you guys this morning. First of all, it has been said, but once again, happy Father's Day to the dads, the grandpas, to those who even stepped into a role of maybe fathering children that weren't their own. Thank you just so much for who you are. And, you know, you get the, the beautiful privilege of being a reflection of our Heavenly Father on earth. So, so thank you for that. Also, if you did not get a donut on your way in or during the turn and shake a hand time, I can see them. There's still some there on your way out. And they're not just for the dads or for everyone. So, you know, we all need a little sugar treat. So if you did not grab one, please feel free to grab one on your way out so that we can celebrate 
the awesome men and dads in our lives. All right, if you are a new guest with us today, our Welcome Center team would love to see you after service, say hello, get to know you, and we have a little gift for you just to say welcome, so you can go ahead and visit them after the service. Also, giving is one of the opportunities that we have to worship our Heavenly Father with our finances. So if you call Kess at home and feel on your heart to give, there are a couple ways you can do so. We have the giving boxes on the back wall or in the foyer. You can also do text to give, and then you can go onto our website at kessid.com slash giving, and there are instructions for how to give on there as well. All right, for the ladies in the room, we have an outing happening just around the corner. We're going to the lavender farm. So we are going to the Scented Acre Lavender Farm on June 29th, and that is going to be from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., and you can sign up on our website or our app under the events section, or if you have any problem finding it, our Welcome Center team would love to help you find it and get signed up. All right, lastly, our Mexico mission team is leaving this Friday. Um, there are, I was just talking to Bob this morning, there are 33 people going from Kesed on this mission trip, and he just told me, like one minute before I came up here, it is 31 of their first times on a mission trip. So... Is that not awesome that we have 31 people going on their first ever mission trip, not just at Kesed, in life. So that is just incredible. As someone who has got the privilege to get to do some missions in my life, I just know how impactful it is, both for the people, but also just for those that are going. Um, and so we would love just this week, again, they're leaving on Friday. They're going to be there for eight days. So just be praying for them for that time, for safety, for peace, for those 31 people who have never gone before that they would experience God and just define divine appointments for the people that they are meeting. They're going to build houses, working in a vision clinic, running a VBA, VBS there, because ours is Vacation Bible. Awesome. There's a school. That's okay. Um, but just for all those meetings that they are going to have with the people that they are going to encounter. All right, that is all that I have for us this morning. So if you guys would join me in prayer as we continue with our service. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just come before you on this Father's Day, and we say thank you that no matter what our experience was with our earthly father, you are the father that is full of goodness, that runs after us, that chases us down, and we ask that good or bad, whatever our experience was and is with our earthly father, that we can just set that down for this next hour to sit in your goodness, in your gentleness, in your patience, in your love, in your steadfast, chesed love for us, that we can absorb that truth this morning, God. We pray for our team that is going to Mexico, that you will just guide their way, that they will have safe travels, that they will meet all of the right people and have all of the conversations that you have laid out before them to have, God. We thank you so much for who you are, for how you love us, and we just come before you this morning and ask that you would just fill us with what you have for us today, God. We pray these things in your name. Amen. How are you guys doing today? Awesome. I'm doing super well. I uh, want to say happy Father's Day to all you fathers or grandfathers in the room or just father figures. Glad you're here with us. Um, hope you feel celebrated and blessed today. Uh, in case we haven't met, my name is Eric and uh, I'm one of the pastors on staff here. I'm relatively new. I've been here for about uh, a little over a month. So if you're new, please come find me and we can be new together. That would be a lot of fun. Um, you know, uh, I, I, we are just so grateful to be a part of this church. My family and I are 
Um, we've been in the Pacific Northwest here for about six, uh, coming up on six years, uh, and we're just so glad that we found Kesed. We love many of you so much already, and this church. Really glad to be here. Um, uh, while, you know, we've been here for some time, um, I actually grew up in California, just a little south of San Francisco in the Silicon Valley. I uh, was born and raised there. Um, went to college at Biola University, where I met my wife, Rebecca, and um, we've been married for about nine years now, coming up on 10 in January. So here's a, a fun photo of our family. Yay. <laughs> um, as you can see, we have two wonderful children, uh, Evelyn, who is two and a half years old, who is such a spunky firecracker and basically runs our household. Uh, she is my oldest, and then uh, our youngest, Levi, um, is one years old, and he is literally 99th percentile in just about everything, um, so we're hoping that the NFL takes him next year for offensive linemen <laughs> in the draft. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, being, my da being, a, being a dad is uh, one of my favorite things in the world. Uh, I'm a relatively new father, um, and some of you have been dads longer than I have been alive. Uh, but it's wonderful. I feel like I get to be a kid all over again and just running around with them and having so much fun. Uh, but, it, you know, it's also really hard at times, really, really difficult. You know, I feel like I can go from zero to 100 with my frustration level. Um, I'm like tearing my hair out, you know, because my kids aren't listening to me. Uh, but even in those moments where, you know, we're tripping over their toys or we're just exhausted at the end of the day, I'm reminded that it is a, a gift from God uh, to, to be their father. And, uh, you know, my, my goal in life, you know, while I'm not a, a, a perfect father, and, and I don't think I'll ever be, uh, but to just be an amazing father for my children. Uh, some of us here have had amazing fathers growing up, and some of you are amazing dads. Uh, but I want to recognize that this day can be really hard for some of us, just like what, what Dave was talking about earlier. Um, some of us have had deep wounds from our fathers. Uh, some of us grew up without them, or maybe they were absent in your life, they maybe they walked out. Uh, some of our fathers aren't around anymore. Uh, maybe they died unexpectedly or, or maybe expectedly, and, and, and today can be a day where we're just missing them. If you have ever struggled at, at some point in your life with understanding that God is a father, you are, are not alone in this place. And, and I just want to recognize that and say, hey, thanks for being here. Thanks for having the courage to show up today. I know that can be really hard. Uh, we're so glad that you've chosen to be present with us this morning. So, we're in a series on forgiveness that we've creatively titled the Forgiveness Series. And a central idea that we are looking to communicate every single week is this. The way of Jesus is the way of forgiveness. The way of Jesus is the way of forgiveness. And here's what Jesus teaches us about that. Uh, forgiveness is a means to release us from our anger prisons. Uh, it, it, it's a way to extend kindness a gift, of repent, uh, a gift to the repentant as a promise to uh, not retaliate when people have hurt us. When we practice forgiving others and even ourselves, we learn to live in the economy of grace that Jesus' kingdom was all about. We cannot ignore the fact that this day um, lines up in our forgiveness series, uh, and it, there's no better story that uh, I, I, I can think about reading than the parable of the forgiving father, or as some of you might know it as the prodigal son, or the two sons. It goes by many names, but today I want us to think of this passage as the parable of the forgiving father. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, or you can follow along with me on the screen. He also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had and traveled to a distant country where he had squandered his estate in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am, dying of hunger. 
I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long ways off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran through his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it, and let's celebrate with a feast. Because the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. As he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has have him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he replied to his father, look, I have been slaving away many years for you. I have never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Son, he said to him, you are always with me, and everything that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. It's the word of the Lord. Take a look at this photo here on the screen. Are any of you familiar with it at all? Do you know the name of it? Anyone know the name? This is Remembrance, Return of the Prodigal Son. It is one of his final works that was completed shortly before he died in 1669, depicting the climactic story in what we just read. A wayward son who returns home, kneeling before his father, begging for forgiveness, pleading to be taken back as a servant rather than a son. Yet, the father has the strength to warmly embrace his son, while onlookers, like his older brother, observe the scandal of the father's compassion. I have spent many moments looking at this photo, pondering its meaning when I come across it occasionally. I like to notice the lighting of the painting and how certain characters are more so centered in the light while the others gradually fade to the darkness. And as we can see in this photo right here, the one that is most in the light is in fact the prodigal son and the father. It's almost like remembrance is drawing us to think about the meaning of forgiveness that is shared between these two individuals. I don't know about you, but I, I find myself asking this question in light of the painting and this parable from Jesus. Why often are fathers the hardest people to forgive? And why are they the hardest to ask forgiveness from? You know, this picture of forgiveness would have been felt much differently if it was between friends, co-workers, or even neighbors. Yet when we think about forgiveness in the context of a father and his children, we're invited into a profound story that explores the wounds we experience from the people who gave us life. I think our fathers were, were humans who experienced their own hurts and wounds. In his book, The Art of Forgiveness, uh, Louis B. Smetta says that learning and understanding how forgiveness works involved rediscovering the humanity of the person who hurt us. Even if that's from our fathers, we're rediscovering their humanity and, and looking at them as though they are human and, and not some animal that is out to hurt us. In our pastor's meeting, we, we got together and we're planning out this series and we came up with this idea um, surrounding understanding the, uh, the context of our fathers, but they, that they were once little boys whom someone had hurt, whom someone may have forgotten, whom someone may have abandoned, and who someone never forgave. And it's hard to imagine this idea of, of understanding our fathers uh, in, the, uh, in the context of being children because we've only understood them uh, in the context of, of, of being our dads. We might have seen pictures or videos or heard stories about them growing up, yet we, we never really knew what the younger them was like. 
I've always asked myself that question, like, would I have been friends with my dad? Would we have had similar interests? Uh, would we have hung out together? Probably. I love my father. But our fathers may have been hurt by their fathers long ago. And if we desire to move towards forgiving them in life, the first step in knowing uh, is that they too are human, weak, frail, and shaped imperfectly just like we are. It is so often we shrink them into caricatures of what they have done to us. Forgiveness not only plays a role in helping us embrace them as fellow image bearers, but also helps us to practice empathy towards them while deflating our sense of ego and pride in the process. Our fathers also teach us about ourselves, our identity, and how we also see God. So much of how we interpret the world comes from what lies behind our eyes. It's not so much what we see, but how we experience it through the lens that was crafted for us during our developing years. Just right now, take a moment to think about what it was like for you growing up and where your father was uh, in your life. What was preached from the pulpit of the dinner table? Where did you experience tender warmth and care from them? Was there a gift that you had received from your father? Was there none at all? Or did they make you feel ashamed or unworthy of love? Pastor Chris may have mentioned last week, you, in fact, are forgivable. And let me, let me preface it this way. Fathers who never forgave never saw themselves as forgivable either. So if you experienced that growing up of a father who did not forgive, it's probably because he never saw himself as forgivable. Fathers teach us about not only how we see ourselves, but they also teach us about how we see God. And so if we desire to know the meaning of forgiveness from our fathers, we must look to the father whom Jesus teaches us about. The beginning of Luke 15, verses 1 and 2, Jesus sits with tax collectors and sinners. And here they are drawing near to hear the gracious words of Jesus. Now, it, it's one thing to know about who sinners are, but if, if you don't know the context of tax collectors, it's that they were thought of as backstabbing robbers. Uh, among their fellow Jewish people, they were considered um, almost to be not like them. So they almost considered them as Gentiles because what they would do is they would charge more money than what the Jewish people actually owed and taking that to feed themselves. And so here Jesus is hanging out with the people who are on the outside often. He, he's hanging out with people who who were deemed by the covenant insiders as like scum of the earth. And the phenomenon of wherever Jesus went, all of these people were coming to hear his messages. The Pharisees and the scribes enter into this whole scene, and they are just filled with disgust and rage about what they are seeing. They're like, they, they, they say here in verse 2, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them, welcomes them into his presence. Can you believe this guy? But instead, upon hearing them, Jesus decides that he's going to tell them a series of parables. The first parable he tells them is about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep, loses one of them, goes off and risks his life to find that one sheep and bring it back to the 99. The second is a parable about a woman who has ten coins, loses that coin, scours her house, and finally finds it. And then rejoices, brings her friends and neighbors to rejoice that she has found something so dear to her that was lost. And now the third story, the forgiving father. This is almost like the punchline of what Jesus really wants this audience to hear. It is here that Jesus does not merely teach us about a father that forgives, but perhaps challenges what people had believed about God's mercy from the very beginning. And, and just as we work through this story, I want us to observe the actions of the Father in this parable, what he does and how he responds, not just to the wayward son, but also to the older brother. In doing so, this passage becomes a way for Jesus to heal our brokenness when it comes to being fathered by God. Look with me in your scriptures to verse 11. If you have them on your phone or a Bible on you, uh, I always like to have my Bible. It's, a, it's, it's wonderful. It says, a certain man has two sons. 
In verse 12, a younger son, the younger son decides that at some point he has reached a breaking point with his father. He wants his share of the estate that is going to come to him before his father dies. Translation, this son has just said, Father, you are dead to me. I want your things rather than you. That's the whole tragedy here. I mean, how many of you have ever been in a place where you felt like your love was rejected by your children? Or just by, or just by, not even by your children, maybe it was someone that you loved dearly and you felt like your love was rejected. A lot of people, yeah, a lot of us out there. How did you respond? Was it in anger? Was, did, you, did you break down crying and in tears? Did you go off and weep bitterly? Was it a little bit of both? It's normal to feel that way. And in those moments can be really, really hard for us to respond. At this point of the story, Jesus' listeners hope to see what the father, how, how he'll respond. Because if a younger son like this is showing dishonor to his father, as the father has every right to kick the son out of the house or even better yet, drive him out of the village. And here's where their jaws hit the floor. In verse 13, the father goes through with this request. He gives his son the share of the estate, way out of character for a Middle Eastern patriarch who owns significant real estate. Every book on parenting would probably tell you not to do this. Don't enable this type of behavior. Here's some insights from Tim Keller on, on, on uh, on this verse. People's various identity were tied up in their place, to their land. To lose part of your land was to lose part of yourself and a major share of your standing in the community. It it even renders this in in, in the text. Uh, When we look at verse 13, uh, the Greek word for property is actually rendered as bios or life. And so it was almost as if it says, and he divided his life between them. Do you see that? The, The fathers doesn't just shrug his shoulders and say, fine, here you go. Here's the estate. Um, you know, don't say, I didn't warn you. But, but he does what the son asks. And so the father in this story, he actually, he tears his life apart. Tears his life apart because uh, it forfeits honor and standing in the community because he loves his son and knows his son and wants to provide for him even though the son doesn't love him back. Father's love is unconditional from the beginning of this story. He actually isn't a reckless father. He's a courageous one. The father of the son willingly goes through unprosperity because he loves his son and he knows this might be the only way to win him back. Might we as fathers have the courage to do the same? You ever think about that? Do we willingly undergo pain, give our very lives away to our children because we, because we love them? Even when all is lost, do we, we somehow have the strength to, to go into those places that can be really scary and vulnerable and where we get hurt easily, but we do so because of the love that we have for our children? I, I know there's a lot of us in this room that have a lot of regrets about parenting. You know, I've, I've only done this for about two and a half years, and, and I already have, th- have things that I'd wish I'd take back. But I can't imagine, like, going, going through life and, and, and realizing, man, you know, I would have I done that differently. I would have I changed this. I wish I could go back and, and make that right. The memories of that traumatic event linger, leading us to wonder what we could have said or done differently to change where we are now. We may wrestle daily with the anger that swells within our hearts, but know this. When we embrace the love of the Father, it gives us the courage even to love in places of great pain and the strength to endure through seasons of agony. So the two previous stories about the lost sheep and the lost coin set up the story's trajectory. They anticipate that somehow, some way, this lost son will find his way home, that he'll come back. So what's going to happen to him? Well, in verse 13, the younger son takes his possessions and journeys to a far-off country. 
Jewish, uh, Jesus' audience was mainly Jewish, so they, in their minds, are interpreting as this, oh yeah, he's going off to a Gentile country, uh, somewhere that's far away from here. One thing leads to another, ends up spending all of his finances and his resources on wild living, and uh, ends up in, at, at a very, very low place. Jesus paints a picture of, of this son um, at literally at, at something as beneath rock bottom. He has to go work for a Gentile. There, he has to be working with pigs, so not only is he physically dirty, he's also spiritually dirty as well. Um, there's no food, and he's lost all of his connections. He doesn't have anyone to just kind of help him out or, 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 or give him a place to stay. Pay attention here. This is really important because once the son realizes, you know, this, this whole thing is, is not working out, maybe I should go back home because everyone else has, uh, you know, all of the other servants there are fed and taken care of real well, and, and here I am starving myself to death. He makes a plan. So verse 18, he says this, Father, I've sinned against you in heaven, heaven and earth before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. I'm sure if my father hears me say this, he'll take me back. He's probably rehearsing this speech in his head over and over and over again. And so, uh, verse 20, the son leaves and returns home. And his father sees him far off in the distance on the outskirts of town. Again, Jesus' listeners would think about how the father would respond. The entire village as well. It's not just the father who's, who's watching this whole thing, but the in, entire village. Now, a little cultural background. Um, this, there, there's actually a, a Jewish ceremony that, that takes place if this whole event was to occur. If like a dishonored son returned, rejected the community and maybe goes off to squander his wealth and comes back home, uh, this whole thing would enact the Kazaza ceremony. Does that sound like a fun word? You're like, ooh, oh boy, Kazaza, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> No, it was not. It was not, it was not fun at all. Um, in fact, uh, you know, Kenneth Bailey, who's a New Testament scholar, says what, what, what happened is that the villagers would come and they would break pottery at the feet of the dishonored individual, symbolizing that they were no longer in community with them. It was a means of permanently breaking relations and one of the most humiliating things that someone could experience. In this ceremony would occur on the outskirts of the village. This was cancel culture in, in first century Judaism. Uh, Jesus' listeners are anticipating that this would happen. And it's not like the people are trying to be mean here. Uh, you, you need to do this because it, this wretched son is a threat to the community. And, and you need to do it because it upholds the fabric that keeps society together. It's almost like, in a crude way, it's almost like if a high school, like Columbia River High School across the street here says, oh, we're not, we're not going to have graduation at, at the end of the year. Um, no, they need to do it because that is honoring to all of the students who have gone through the program. So not having it would be kind of detrimental. So as the son is returning home, the father is the first to notice the son. He's, the text says he's filled with compassion. It's felt within his guts. Knowing the ceremony is about to happen, he runs. Middle Eastern men don't run, okay? I don't, how many of you can still run? None of you, okay. <laughs> awesome. What he would do is he would take the long robe and, and he would hanker, uh, hanker it up and like tie it above his knees. He'll race throughout the village, and the entire town is looking at him doing this. And it's almost like he's exposing the nakedness of his legs. In this culture, that was a deeply shameful thing. It's exposed for everybody to see, all to stop this ceremony from happening. And the father embraces his son as everyone's watching this take place. He kisses him, holds him in his arms. And his son is bringing him, himself forth to, to rehearse this speech that has been rehearsed. He says, Father, I've sinned against you from heaven and on earth. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And before he enters into the spot that says, make me like one of your hired servants, 
the father signals for his servants to clothe his nakedness, put a ring on his finger, and sandals on his feet. And when the son believed that he was unforgivable, the father declared him worthy. By this, the son heals the father's uh, the father heals uh, the son's shame by shaming himself, and this is why a father's forgiveness is one that restores. Your mistakes and your failures are not the end of your life. There are plenty of things that you and I wish that we hadn't done. Maybe it was things said to our children or to our fathers. Maybe it was the parenting style that we had or lack thereof. And I just think to myself, I could have I could have fixed things with my father or my kids. And the tragedy is life only moves in one direction. There's no DeLorean that will take me back in time to change the past. Through this story, Jesus tells us by embracing God's forgiveness, it resurrects us from the pit. The son knew that his father had an abundance of food but was met with an abundance of forgiveness instead. Profound, isn't it? This is exactly, uh, the father actually talks about the son this way. He says, my son was dead and is alive again. Through the father's forgiveness, the younger son is now a new person. He has new life. Literally, the word that is used here is resurrected. That means through our heavenly father's forgiveness, we can experience that same resurrection and channel that to others when we continue to make a practice of forgiveness. What might it look like in your life right now? Consider embracing forgiveness to resurrect relationships and to free us from past mistakes. This is powerful stuff, guys. Come on. Just when you thought that was the height of the story, here's the last thing that Jesus wants to tell everyone who's listening. How we got? How we doing? Am I still awake? Yes, we are. That's good. <laughs> the older brother that we haven't really heard about up until this point is working out in the field, and he hears about what's going on. So he returns home, and, and upon hearing that his younger brother has now returned, and that the father has slaughtered the fattened calf that it was saving for, for Christmas this year, he's enraged. Whole barbecue is being thrown for him. Smoked brisket, burnt ends, all the good stuff, you know. The older son is upset and infuriated. And now, in verse 28, the father notices and calls out to the older son to join in this party. Ironically, the older son, who was part of the father's household, is now outside the household. Do you see kind of what's going on here? See how Jesus masterfully kind of tells this story, reversing the spatial positions? The younger son is, who, who went away is now inside the household, and the older son who is here with the father is now outside of it. And the older son comes to his father, and he doesn't even call him father. He says, look, <laughs> look, you, th- this younger son dishonored you completely. He, he went out and squandered his wealth on prostitutes and wild living. And when he comes back now, like you slaughtered the calf for him? Like, are you out of your mind? Where is the justice in all of this? The older son maps out the cry about how our world interprets forgiveness. I will not forgive what he did until my pain has been acknowledged and resolved. Sometimes you and I will sit in that as well. We don't really want to forgive until we know that our pain has been acknowledged and and absolved. We may not feel forgiven. We we only respond to things once, uh, once we feel and move past them. But the father responds this way to his son. It's full of warmth and compassion providing the remedy he needs in order to see the joy of forgiveness. But in verse 32, I'll read it right here. It says this, But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. You see that? Rejoicing is the key. That's the right thing to do here. The father is inviting the son to participate in rejoicing. I had a falling out with a friend several years ago. Um, This friend was someone that I deeply trusted 
in life uh, with my struggles and my feelings. Uh, it was a, a time in my life when I was very new to ministry, um, and I was figuring out um, how to be a youth pastor um, and all of the frustrations and, uh, you know, fun obstacles that go along with it. Uh, and, I, and at one point in our relationship, uh, he betrayed my trust, and uh, the relationship I thought we had was severed. It wasn't until a couple of years ago he actually reached out to me and apologized, asking for my forgiveness. Uh, to be honest, it was really painful uh, hearing back from him again. I, I didn't really know what to think of it. And it, and it took me a while, but I, I, I finally granted him that forgiveness. But there are still moments when I grieve the loss of this relationship, even today. However, I'm now challenged to actually rejoice in the miracle of forgiveness here. And keep this as the forefront of my mind. Rejoicing in forgiveness and making it something to celebrate is key to freely giving it. I'll say that again. Rejoicing in forgiveness and making it something to celebrate is key to freely giving it. This is why forgiveness is the Father's delight. The Father knows the power of forgiveness and how it's given freely because he knows what it can do. It can change lives. Here's Tim Keller again on the Father's forgiveness. He says, If the preaching of our ministers and the practice of our parishioners do not have the same effect on people that Jesus had, then we must not be declaring the same message that Jesus did. If our churches aren't appealing to younger brothers, they must be more full of elder brothers than we'd like to think. God delights in forgiveness. He's actually excited to forgive you. Sometimes it's hard to feel like, God, uh, did, I, did I repent enough? Um, did I say I'm sorry? Did that actually take place? Is, th is this a good enough? Um, is, is this good enough for you? Of course it is. God wants to forgive you. He's here with open arms so that you run to him so he may embrace you and remind you that you're his son or his daughter. Changes everything when we think about repenting. We're no longer afraid to approach God, but rather joyfully run to him when we screw up. And believing that he will never forgive is a lie from the evil one. One of the most dangerous things of our, from our walk with God is to believe that we're not allowed in church here for the mistakes that we have made in the past, or if we've just maybe screwed up last week. If you've ever struggled with feeling like you're unworthy of the things you have done, this here is, is a place for you. And you are welcome here. This is not we were judged for what happened years ago or yesterday. We need to make this place an, a, a special, sacred area where forgiveness is celebrated. And we do this by making forgiveness not a painful process, but reframing it as an extraordinarily joyful one. Father is full of abundant forgiveness. That's what I want to leave you here today. We believe in a God who grants forgiveness to those who trust in Jesus' death and resurrection, his son. Allow yourself to embrace God's forgiveness and mercy in this area in your life. And when you allow yourself to do this, you will have freedom from that cycle of shame. Know that God is full of abundant love for you, and he wants to restore you, wants you to delight to giving it to you freely. Make this a part of your daily prayer rhythm. Talk about forgiveness in your family. It's not too late to make that a part of your culture right here and right now. And if you desire to do this, to make forgiveness a part of your life, I invite you to do this. Take yourself back to a moment in your life where you felt just utterly broken, where you were just so in shambles by the weight of, of, of sin and shame in your life. You'd known you had messed up. You were maybe at a spot that was rock bottom. Maybe it was a place where you had felt like you messed up in being a father. Where you wounded in the surface because of the absence of your father's love in your life and it has left you on the ground. And before we come to the table today, we wanted to share a song with you that we as a staff here at, at Kesed came across. It was written from the perspective of the prodigal son. This is a song for when you don't know how to come home. 
And when you don't have the words to say or the courage to lift yourself off the ground from the pain in your life, I want to create space for you right now to just listen to this song, listen to the lyrics, sit in the love of the Father, and allow that to wash over you. God is a Father who loves you more than any father ever could. His arms are open wide, waiting for you to come running home. But what value without you? I could write a thousand songs to ever draw your heart, but more than nothing. You see the depths of me when you. mercy in the light of your song You see my heart 
Through the eyes of your mercy, in the light of your sun, you love me with open arms and the pride of a father. Oh, you love me. out your communion cups, bread. Coming to the table this morning, we are reminded that we have a God who gives us unconditional love, whose forgiveness restores, and who, and who delights in giving it to us freely. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he sat around with his closest disciples and, and had a meal that was going to tell the story of forgiveness. He took bread, he broke it, and said, this is my body. Each time you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. He took the cup and he said, this, this cup represents the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. As often as we take of this bread and that we drink of the cup, Claim the Lord's death until he comes. May you go from this place knowing that you are loved beyond anything. You, you, are, you are so, so loved by your heavenly Father. Even when you, if you didn't feel love from your Father growing up or the spaces in your life where you just didn't feel like that was enough, God gives you abundant love and his forgiveness is ready for you to come running with his arms open wide. Father, help us to live this day to the full, being true to who you are in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. And Holy Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say, amen. Happy Father's Day, everyone. May the Lord be with you and with your spirit.